Welcome to numerical methods. So we have started a section on American Monte Carlo, the valuation of Bermudan options. So we started with the valuation of Bermudan options. And we found out that if we would like to value a Bermudan option in a Monte Carlo simulation, we are in need for an estimate or a numerical method that allows us to calculate the conditional expectation operator. And that is usually called American Monte Carlo yeah, because it is needed to value American options slash Bermudan options. Let's have a short recapitulation on our section on Bermudan valuation because that provides us a lot of intuition what we could do to derive a method that gives us the conditional expectation later. So here was our definition of the Bermudan option. So we have a set of exercise dates, and at these exercise dates, you have the right to receive the value of, un of an underlying financial product, yeah, but you have the right only at one of these exercise states. Yeah? So you can exercise once or never. Well, if you anticipate the result that we perform optimal exercise, you, know, you can define the value of the Bermudan recursively going backward. Yeah? So the value of the Bermudan at time ti with exercise from ti to tn is of course yeah decide what has the larger value is it the underlying that you would receive if you exercise at time ti or is it the value of the bermudan that has now exercise times ti plus one to tn yeah so the remaining exercise rights, the value of the remaining exercise rights, but these, and that's now important, evaluated at this time of decision. So it is here where we require a conditional expectation, yeah, namely the conditional expectation of the value that we have to find in the previous backward iteration step, and we need to apply the conditional expectation to this, this guy. So we could write this in a single line. Yeah. So here we have now the maximum yeah, over these two values that give us the Bermudan value at time ti, yeah, which is then choose the larger one yeah, of the underlying and the conditional expectation of the future Bermudan rights, yeah, depending on yeah, which which one is, is now larger. Um, we made a small modification. You see that we moved to relative prices. Yeah? So these guys, you have a tilde now. So this spares us a little bit the division by the numerea that we need here in this valuation of the Bermudan value. And then we derived an alternative way of describing the value of the Bermudan option by introducing the optimal exercise strategy, so the random time capital T. So the optimal exercise time is just the time at which we exercise into the corresponding underlying. Of course, we find this time in the same way. Yeah, We always compare the value of the future Bermudan rights to the value if we exercise our, our right at time ti. Yeah? And then we take this time as the exercise time if it is better to exercise into the underlying and then we go backward and update this so we take the smallest uh, such time yeah the first time at which exercise into the underlying has a higher value than waiting for all the future exercise rights so this defines us here this random time capital t yeah so it is different on every 
path omega. And if we have this, we can represent the Bermudan as just on every sample path, it is the value of the underlying corresponding to the optimal exercise time. If we define now the time discrete stochastic process U tilde of Ti to be the value of the underlying that is received at time Ti, evaluated in time Ti, and also numeraire relative, then the quantity that we are interested in is U tilde, the value of the underlying of capital T, that is the optimal exercise underlying. And from that, we just need to calculate now the expectation, yeah, because the U tilde of capital T is what we receive from the Bermudan if we perform optimal exercise. So this is a single random variable. Yeah? So the single random variable is defined by taking the value of the underlying at the optimal exercise time on the sample path omega, which means take the value of the underlying corresponding to the optimal exercise time and, of course, the value on that uh, sample path. We had a nice algorithm to construct this random variable u tilde of uh, capital T. So this is the backward algorithm. So we will go backward, yeah? uh, update always the time. And then, of course, just update here this vector of values with the values of the corresponding underlying. So this then modified a little bit here, this definition of the value of the Bermudan towards this one, yeah, where we have the same criteria here. So compare the value of the underlying to the value of the Bermudan. Yeah, choose the underlying if it has a larger value, but otherwise just keep this random variable that contains the value of the future underlyings that you receive at their respective optimal exercise time so far, yeah, optimal exercise time so far. So what would be optimal after TI? Yeah? So this is a backward algorithm that defines us this random variable going backward in time. So here you have a small illustration. Yeah, You initialize this random variable U, say with zero in the end, and then you take the conditional expectation and compare that to the value of the underlying. And where the underlying has a higher value, you update this vector. Yeah? Then you take again conditional expectation of this vector here. And you compare this conditional expectation to the underlying, and where the underlying has a higher value, you update this vector. So you see here, you always take the conditional expectation of this vector here in the comparison that defines your decision, but then you just update the vector. So the important thing is that the conditional expectation is not anymore here, yeah, where we have the value of the random variable. Okay, so go backward and update this vector. And in the end, you have the vector that contains the value of the corresponding underlyings. So here the red one at the optimal exercise time. Yeah? So on this sample path, the optimal exercise is in T3. And of course, it contains the value on that sample path. So this sample path here. Then I can represent now the value of the Bermudan as an unconditional expectation. And the nice thing is that now this conditional expectation is only in the condition here in the exercise criteria that compares the expected value of continuing to the value of the underlying. So this is the important difference here. Yeah? We do not have the conditional expectation anymore in this part. And we also had a small picture that illustrated what is the improvement that we achieved yeah, by removing the conditional expectation from here. 
this was here our figure. So the comparison is here that this blue line here is the true conditional expectation. And this orange line here is maybe some poor estimate. Yeah. So what happens if you only have a numerical method that has a poor estimate for the conditional expectation operator? So then in, in the first version, we just have this poor estimate, our mistake here in the decision. In the second version, we also have it in the value that we will use. Okay, so that means if you just have it in the decision, you have a wrong intersection point yeah, where you switch from choose the underlying or continue. So you would flip your decision at that point here because at that point, this one is larger now than your estimate of the conditional expectation. So you just have a wrong decision. So the error that you make is that you take the green value here where you should have used the blue value. So the error that you make is just this triangle here. However, if the poor estimate is also in your value, yeah, it means that you always take the orange value when you should have used the blue value. So the error is not only that you make your decision at the wrong point, the error is also that you use the wrong value. So you have this error here in addition. So that was the figure from our last session. Yeah. So taking the wrong decision yeah, just gives us here a small error in this triangle, but taking also here the wrong value gives us the complete error of our wrong estimate in our uh, valuation. So this backward algorithm now gives us a method to value a Bermudan option once we have a conditional expectation estimator to decide where, whether we should exercise or not. In some rare cases, the conditional expectation has an analytic formula. So for example, a Bermudan option with two exercise dates uh, where a European option has an uh, analytic formula, like for example, uh, a Black Scholes model. In that case, you would have an analytic formula for here this conditional expectation. Yeah? Because at the first exercise date, you have the right to choose the underlying or an European option. Yeah? So it is an option between the underlying and the European option. And for that European option, you could maybe have an analytic formula. So in rare cases, you could have here an analytic formula. If you now look at the implementation of the Bermudan option in our library, you will already discover the backward algorithm and you can consider maybe conditional expectation at, as a black box. Maybe very quickly, let's have a look into this algorithm, into this implementation. So here in the product section, yeah, where also our Asian option is, there's a Bermudan option. So this is a simple Bermudan option like in our example that pays you S of Ti minus Ki, yeah, maybe also multiplied with a constant, with a notional, uh, at different times Ti. So th these are your underlines. So you have the right to receive this at one of the times Ti or yeah, nothing. Uh, so what do we do? Yeah, we have a constructor that has the exercise times, the TIs, the notionals, you know, the constants that we multiply with the strikes KI. You know? And if you take a look at the evaluation method, okay, there are different tricks implemented here. I will skip a few of them, but you will see that we go backward in time. So this is the backward algorithm. So we loop backward over all exercise dates. We initialize our random variable u, the one that we update if we go backward, yeah, the ui, uh, we initialize it to zero. 
And then we go backwards. So what do we get? We take the value of the stock, the value of the numeraire, and the payment if we exercise is S minus K, yeah, multiplied with the notional, and then everything is numeraire relative, so we divide with the numeraire. So this is what we get if we exercise, this is our underlying. So now we take the conditional expectation of the vector u, so you see there is a conditional expectation estimator here, and this value, yeah, which we have initialized here to zero, uh, from that we take the conditional expectation. There is here, get conditional expectation. This is a black box currently for us. No? Then we have the conditional expectation of this u i plus one, uh, actually u tilde i plus one, and our exercise criteria is is u tilde larger than what we get if we exercise, so larger than our underlying. Yeah? So this is our exercise criteria. So based on this exercise criteria, yeah, so now skip this part, yeah, um, we will now choose, and now you see that this is the important part. Yeah? We will choose either this guy, the value vector, or that guy, yeah? so we will not choose the conditional expectation. Yeah? So based on this exercise criteria, which is conditional expectation minus exercise value, we will here below choose either keep the value, so keep the U, or take the value of the underlying. So we perform this update and we loop backward. And in the end, yeah, we just return this value. So just take the expectation of that value, that is the value of the value. Okay, so this is if we have an estimator for the conditional expectation. So we need to talk about this black box here. So how do we estimate the conditional expectation in a Monte Carlo simulation? And I will first show you two methods that do not work. Yeah, it's sometimes nice yeah, to also study methods that do not work because by getting an intuition why it does not work, yeah, you get a lot of you know, insights that maybe help you to derive a method that in the end works. And the first one would work, but it does not work because it is computationally too time consuming. It would be perform the full re-simulation. So if we do not have an analytic formula for the conditional expectation, we could think of creating a Monte Carlo simulation you know, to calculate the conditional expectation. So we would create, say, at the first exercise time T1, a new Monte Carlo simulation to calculate the conditional expectation. If you think just of the Bermudan auction with two exercises, this looks now like that, okay? So I have T1 here, the first exercise time, okay? And then here in the end, I have, say, T2, my second exercise time. And now I have an option on an option. So maybe here in the end, we have some kind of payoff function with a certain strike. And I would like to calculate the conditional expectation. So conditional to having arrived in T1 at this point here. So conditional expectation means that you have a certain probability distribution. So conditional to having arrived at the green dot. Now my probability distribution, yeah, so this looks all here a little bit normal, like a Bachelier model, might look like that. Yeah. So take the conditional expectation. So you could think of just create a re-simulation. Yeah? So just create just another Monte Carlo simulation that samples many different sample paths here. The problem is that you have to create this new Monte Carlo simulation, a simulation inside the simulation, at every condition point. Yeah? The conditional expectation is a random variable. Yeah? So it will have a different value, for example, if you have reached here 
this point below. Yeah? So from that point below, you would start your new simulation. And you would see, of course, a different conditional expectation because your starting point has changed. So this means for two exercise dates, you would require number of simulation paths that you use from 0 to T1 multiplied with number of simulation paths that you use from T1 to T2 for each condition state. So if both are the same, it is number of simulation paths squared. Yeah, of course, this two here is related to the number of exercise states. Mm -hmm. So actually for three, you would create a re-simulation inside the re-simulation. So if you would have three, you would start another one here or another one here. So it would be number of sample paths to the power of three. So it would grow exponentially. So well, that's not feasible. So this method becomes impractical. Now, if you have, say, more than one or two exercise dates, yeah? so you have an option on an option on an option, so the number of sample paths this grows exponentially. Well, but this picture provides us with a good intuition. Yeah? And later, the one of the methods that work will be quite close to what we are doing here. Okay, so what's now the problem with a Monte Carlo simulation? Yeah, the problem with a Monte Carlo simulation, so a simulation that simulates our sample path, yeah, is that we do not have a suitable discretization of the filtration. Okay, what do I mean with that? Maybe a small recapitulation. What is the filtration? I mean, I wrote here conditional expectation, yeah, so conditional to FTI. Yeah? So FTI is a sigma field, and the collection of the FTI, so this is the filtration. Yeah, what is this object, and what do I mean that I do not have a discretization of this? So small recapitulation, filtration. So for a time, discrete ETO process, like for example, the one that we generate with our generalized Euler scheme, the filtration is generated by the Brownian increments. So the Brownian increments, they contain the information, yeah, what has happened on the past. So if you know the Brownian increments, you know the value that you have generated. Yeah? So the sigma field FTI corresponds to the information which values have we observed in the increments delta W T0 to delta W Ti minus one. So delta W Ti minus one is the Brownian increment from Ti minus one to Ti. Yeah? So if something is FTI measurable, it means that you know its value by knowing what has happened up to time Ti. To illustrate this, I have a very nice figure here. So this figure on the next slides. Because just illustrate this with, say, instead of a Brownian increment, some increment that can take only two values. So I just have two different values. For example, you flip a coin. The coin has heads or tails. Or, like we also had in another session, I have a binomial distributed um, increment. So say a delta B. Yeah? So instead of a Brownian increment that has a normal distributed outcome, I just have now a binomial distributed outcome, so plus one or minus one with probability one half, yeah? or heads or tails yeah, with probability one half. 
Yeah, then you see that at each increment, you can have two different values. Yeah, so I have maybe here heads or maybe here tail, yeah, or up and down. And then the next increment will add another outcome. Yeah, so it can go, go up again or it can go down again. Your sigma field ft0 is just the empty set or the set that contains all, all events. This means you have actually no information. You just have the information that one of these events here can happen. Now, if you throw the coin, yeah, head or tail, yeah, or if you sample your binomial distributed random variable for the first time step, yeah, you know the first outcome. So this will allow you to distinguish, is it possible that omega 1 up to omega 4 will be the outcome? Yeah? Yes, this is possible if you had the result had, yeah? because then you are on the upper branch. You cannot distinguish between these guys. Yeah, You do not know if omega 1 or omega 3 will be at the outcome. But you know that if you have the head, your outcome has to lie in this set. So the sigma field has become a little bit finer. You can now distinguish between these two sets here. So now you sample the next increment, the increment from T1 to T2. This means you know two outcomes. The third one is still unknown. So this allows us to distinguish even more e events. Yeah? So the sigma field has become even finer. Yeah? So now you can distinguish between these four different sets. Yeah? So if something is measurable with respect to this sigma field, it means that its value is constant on such a fine set. Yeah? because it cannot have two different values, yeah, because then it means that you have to distinguish between these two. It can have different values on these sets. yeah. So it can have a different value on omega 7, omega 8, and omega 1 and omega 2, because you can distinguish between being here or being here. So this is what the conditional expectation does. Yeah? The conditional expectation is, for example, if you can distinguish between all events, yeah, taking the expectation of this backward, conditional to F2, yeah? creating a random variable that is constant on omega 1 and omega 2. Yeah? So it is the expectation of these two outcomes, conditional that I have arrived here. So what do I mean now by I do not have a discretization of the filtration? So in my Monte Carlo simulation, the sample path omega look like that. So they do not have at a future point in time, say, for example, at our exercise time, they do not have the property that they have some kind of common past, like for example, that guy that runs here and then deviates. Yeah, They do not have this property. So there are different sample paths. And if you know on which sample path you are in T1, you know the complete future. Yeah. So it's actually from the beginning, the finest sigma field yeah, that we have in this Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah? It's completely different events, and we immediately know, if we are on omega-7, we immediately know the whole future evolution of this sample path. So we cannot build a conditional expectation yeah, by taking two sample paths that have the same past and average over these. Here in this picture, we can do this. Yeah? So we create finer and finer sigma fields. Yeah? And that allows us also 
to calculate conditional expectations. Yeah, maybe you know a binomial tree is also a numerical method and implementing the backward algorithm in a binomial tree yeah, is natural because you can go just backward and take the average of these two and consider this as the conditional expectation. And then you take the average of these and you consider this as the conditional expectation. So in this numerical method here, I have also a discretization of the uh, sigma field of the filtration. And you also have a sample path. Yeah? The sample path goes here up, down, up. Yeah? That is the sample path. The point is that here I can only attain discrete values. Yeah, It goes up or down, right? If the filtration is generated by the Brownian increments, yeah, actually at one time step, I have a continuum of possible values. So it's completely unlikely to generate the same value again. So you also see that the number of states you have here is related to the number of different values. Yeah, So it's two at this here. It's two to the power of two, four yeah? at the next time. It's two to the power of three, so eight at the next time. If I can create, say, infinity amount of different values, it's this infinity amount yeah, to the power of two yeah, or three. Or if we have a Monte Carlo simulation and we just generate number of sample paths, then you see this is our re-simulation. So our re-simulation would be the corresponding discretization of the filtration. We would have number of sample paths here and then number of sample paths squared here and then number of sample paths to the power of three here. So what is missing is that we do not have this re-simulation, which is the discretization of the filtration. Okay, so let's study the next method that does not work. Yeah, why not just forget about this and use the sample path that we have as an approximation for our conditional expectation? Yeah? So this is like re-simulation, but we just use a single sample path. So we use a Monte Carlo simulation with a single path to approximate the conditional expectation. This method yeah, works but generates wrong results because it contains perfect foresight. Yeah? You have knowledge about the future. Nevertheless, uh, nice to study it yeah, because understanding that there is the problem of uh, foresight is also important for the methods that we will discuss later, like binning yeah, or the least square Monte Carlo method. So next idea is instead of using a full re-simulation, we just stick to the sample path that we generate. You know? So this means I now approximate my conditional expectation operator here with just the value that I observe on the sample path. Yeah. So with just the value of which I calculate the conditional expectation. So this looks a little bit strange here, yeah, this approximation, but you have to recall that the conditional expectation is a random variable. Yeah? So I have the value at time t2 divided by the numerator. Yeah? So from that value, I would like to calculate the conditional expectation. Yeah? So conditional to ft1. So the conditional expectation of this conditional to ft1 this is a random variable. It is a random variable that has the properties that it is FT1 measurable, which means if FT1 is generated by the sets, say, omega 1 to omega 2, yeah, if these are the finest set that generates this uh, sigma field, then this random variable is constant on such a set omega 1, yeah, piecewise constant. So if 
I plug in here an omega, I get a value. And this random variable, conditional expectation, has to have the property that it is piecewise constant you know, on the sets that generate the FT1. And the approximation that I make now is that I use as an approximation the value of this guy, the guy of which I calculate the conditional expectation. So here our argument, the V T2 divided by N of T2. I use just the value of that guy without averaging over all these sample paths yeah, for which the conditional expectation has to be constant. And I just use it on the single sample path I have. So you could also now just plug in this omega. You immediately see a problem here. This random variable here is FT1 measurable, but this is a value from the future. It is FT2 measurable. Could be FT1 measurable, but not necessarily. So this means that since the filtration encodes information, the VT2 divided by NT2 on the sample pass omega contains information about the future. So issue is the estimate that we use here is not necessarily FT1 measurable. Yeah, what does this mean? Uh, if now the conditional expectation is part of my exercise criteria, so the information I base my choice on, I have information about the future, I can exercise super optimal. So the exercise will be super optimal because it is based on information about the future. I have a very nice simple example here. So consider that I just have two sample paths. I just have the sample path omega one and omega two. I'm simulating a stock and I have two exercises. I can exercise in T1 and in T2. So assume the sample paths are now such that from T0 to T1, they agree in value. So the stock moves here to say two. Yeah? And then they deviate, so one sample path goes up, you know, the stock moves to four, the other sample path goes down, the stock moves to one. And you have now the option to receive the value of the stock at one of these uh, two times. What is the value of the underlying at time T1? It is just you receive the value of the stock, which is the two. What is the conditional expectation? Now, the conditional expectation is conditional to having arrived at time T1, you take the average of these two outcomes. Assume the two outcomes have the same probability, so one half. So I just average now one half times four plus one half times one. So this is five divided by two, this is 2.5. So you see, in expectation, you get more if you don't exercise. So we get a 2.5 in expectation if we just continue. So this means your exercise criteria would now compare the conditional expectation yeah, for continuing with the value of the underlying so the V1 in T1, and you will see, okay, don't exercise, just continue. So your random time is always choose T2. This means your Bermudan value is the expectation of these two guys here, the four and the one, and it's a 2.5. If you now make our approximation, yes, that you approximate this conditional expectation by just the value that you observe 
in time t2. Yeah? So you see, this is here the important thing, that you take the value that you will finally get. Then your conditional expectation random variable is not ft1 measurable, because ft1 measurable means that it has to be a constant, yeah? because in this example, all the sample paths that move to up to time t1 are identical. Yeah? So the sigma field that we have in time t1 is just the one that consists of the empty set and the full set. But now if we take here t2, I can now distinguish the two. So the conditional expectation will be either the four if I am on sample pass omega one or the one if I'm on sample pass omega two. Huh? Small typo here, this is a two. So my conditional expectation is a random variable, but here my approximated conditional expectation is also a random variable, but it is not FT1 measurable. Now I use this guy to make my decision. Yeah, of course, my decision is against the same value of the underlying, the true, but now I observe that, well, if I already know that I'm on the sample path that goes up, I will continue. If I'm on the sample path that goes down, I will exercise. So this means now your optimal exercise time is continue T2 if you are on sample pass omega 1 or exercise, so T1 if you are on sample pass omega 2. So also you see that this is not a stopping time yeah? because the criteria that T of omega is less or equal than uh, T1, that this is FT1 measurable, this is not fulfilled, this is not a stopping time. So there's a lot going wrong here. So now if this, if you have this information of the future, you are exercising super optimal. So what is what your Bermudan receives? Yeah, the Bermudan receives the value of the underlying at the optimal exercise time. The optimal exercise time is now this guy that was wrongfully calculated. So you will receive four on pass, sample pass omega one and two on sample pass omega two. So I will receive now one half times four plus one half times two. So my Bermuden value is now a three. So you see the value of the Bermuden is higher because you have knowledge about the future. You can exercise super optimal. Uh, yeah, so actually this is uh, interesting yeah, because uh, to some extent we found now that maybe we can create an estimate, but we know that the estimate is too large yeah, because there is super optimality inside. So here in the script, you find just now the description yeah, of what I explained. So perfect foresight is not a suitable method for estimating the conditional expectation. I have a small uh, numerical experiment that compares this for the special case of a Bermudan option that has only two exercise states and a Black-Scholes model. Because in this situation, yeah, so we had this situation before. Okay, so in this situation, I have an analytic formula for the conditional expectation. And this is also good for the intuition because what is this analytic formula? It is the Black-Scholes formula yeah, for a European option where the time parameter is T2 minus T1. Yeah? So the remaining time. Yeah? So this has to be remembered. Yeah? So this is important. And well, the interest rate R and the Volatility parameter sigma are just the model parameters, but what is the initial value of the stock? The initial value of the stock is the value where you have arrived. Yeah? So it is S of T1. 
So you have a random variable, s of t1, and this you plug in in a Black-Scholes formula. And you see that your conditional expectation is, again, an ft1 measurable random variable. Yeah? So, so the value of the stock at time t1, this is ft1 measurable. And if you plug this in as a starting value in a Black-Scholes formula, all the values that you get out is ft1 measurable Black-Scholes option prices. So important if I now look at this example, I'm using the Black Schultz formula for this time span here, yeah, where the starting value here is the value of the stock that I observe at this time T1. So let's have a look at this uh, little experiment. And here in this experiment, I'm creating um, two plots. One plot is using the correct exercise criteria, and the other one is using perfect foresight. Uh, the correct exercise criteria, I have it because I have Black Scholes uh, formula. Yeah? So for the correct exercise criteria, I can use Black Scholes formula. So you find this as always here in our lecture repository. So this is now the package Monte Carlo Bermuden, and it's called Bermuden Option Exercise in Monte Carlo Black Scholes plot. Let's have a short look because I will use these plots also later to illustrate some aspects. So let's move to our lecture repository, and there's here Monte Carlo Bermuden, and we find this little experiment, this little program, yeah, that now looks at a Bermudan option with two exercise dates, T1 and T2, under a Black Schultz model. So for my model, I have some model parameters. Initial value of the stock is 100. Initial value of the stock in T0. Risk-free rate R is 5%. Volatility is 30%. Initial time is 0. My time horizon is 2, and my time step is 1, yeah? So I have one exercise date in T1 equals 1, and one exercise date in T2 equals 2. The number of Monte Carlo sample paths are just 5,000 because I would like to plot something, seed of the random number generator. And now the product parameters. Yeah? So this here is the T1 for my first exercise date, and this is the strike K1. So I have the option to receive S minus K1 in T1. At uh, T2, I have the option to receive S minus K2. Uh, K2 is a little bit larger. Actually, this situation corresponds exactly here to our picture. Yeah? So you have the option to receive here S minus K2 with a slightly larger strike or S minus K1. S of T2 minus K2 in T2 and S of T1 minus K1 in T1. The Black schultz formula that corresponds to this payoff yeah, is maybe just curved line here and there's a certain point yeah, at which you switch. So this corresponds to this uh, situation. I create now my Monte Carlo simulation using our tools that we have and you see this is very short. Yeah, Just the four lines. Initialize the Black Scholes model. Initialize a Brown in motion, Brown in increments. Yeah, I need two Brown in increments. One from T0 to T1, one from T1 to T2. Initialize an Euler scheme that simulates the two steps. Yeah? Wrap everything together under a class that provides me the value of the stock at certain times and the value of the numeraire. So first thing that we fetch is the value of the stock at time T2. So this is my random variable stock in T2. Then I fetch the S of T1, my random variable stock in T1. So what is the value that I receive if I exercise in T2? Well, it's a Bermudan option. I also have the right to never exercise. So the value that I receive is S of T2 minus K2 
and from that the maximum of that and zero. Yeah? So this is the payoff that I receive if I exercise in time T2. So value that I receive if I exercise in T1 is the value of the stock in T1 minus K1 from that, the maximum of that and zero. So these are my two underlines. Now I'm in the lucky situation that I have a Black Scholes formula to calculate the conditional expectation of V2 of T2 uh, divided by the numeraire N of T2 multiplied with the numeraire N of T1. Yeah. So this is my value of the second option observed in time T1. So let's look carefully here at the Black Scholes formula. You see that this is a special version of the Black Scholes formula that takes here as a first argument a random variable. Yeah. So the initial value of the stock can be a random variable and it returns a random variable. So it's a pathwise Black Scholes formula. So the initial value of the stock is the value of the stock in time T1. So this is now my condition value. Then it's the Black Scholes formula with risk free rate R sigma. The maturity is the remaining time. It's T2 minus T1. And the strike is, of course, the K2. You can also peek into this formula here. And you see, okay, there is a little bit of transformation done. And then it's just the normal Black Schultz formula. But now everything is calculated on random variables. Yeah, So I use the random variable object to perform the calculation. So it's pathwise operations. So I'm in the lucky case that I have an analytic conditional expectation so I can make my decision. So next step is I will transform all values to be numeraire relative. Yeah? So I divide by the numeraire. So the value relative option two in T2 yeah, is the value of the option two in T2, observed in T2, divided by the numeraire in time T2. And here these, they were observed in T1. They are divided by the numeraire in time T1. Yeah? So also this here, yeah, my Black Scholes formula, my conditional expectation divided by the numeraire in T time T1. So now comes my exercise criteria. The true exercise criteria compares the conditional expectation with the value of the underlying. Yeah? So I compare now the value of the option two observed in T1 uh, divided by the numeraire. So this is here my Black Schultz formula. I compare now the true conditional expectation with the value that I receive if I exercise. Uh, so this guy, uh, which is S of T1 minus K1. So I compare these two and based on which one is larger, I take so, so you see, this is also the backward algorithm. Yeah, I do not take the conditional expectation, but I take the value that I receive in the future divided by the numeraire. Yeah, so the conditional expectation only enters here into the into the choice. So I choose either continue or exercise. Now I have the same with perfect foresight. And you see, it's a, just a tiny little difference. Instead of using the value of the second option observed in T1, so my conditional expectation, I use the value of the second option observed at its future payment time. So the choice is based now on value relative option two observed in T2. So, which is this quantity divided by the numeraire, which is the true value that I receive. So, this is the Bermudan value pathwise where the exercise criteria used perfect foresight. Okay, then just divide this value with the numeraire, uh, sorry, just multiply. Um, so all these uh, values are now numeraire relative. Yeah? So if I would like to have the value, I just take the expectation and multiply with the numeraire at evaluation time. Yeah? So I multiply with the numeraire at initial time and take the expectation. I get the true Bermudan value with the 
true decision based on my analytic conditional expectation, and I get the Bermudan value with the foresight. Um, I, pre I print the two results, okay, but before we run this, I also generate now three different plots. Uh, these are scatter plots. So on the horizontal axis, I plot the value of the stock that I have observed in time T1. And on the vertical axis, I plot what I receive if I continue. Yeah? So this is the so-called continuation value. So this is the value where I have arrived, and this is the value that I will receive if I continue. So for this so-called continuation value, I now uh, make a plot, but I also plot uh, the Black-Schultz formula and all the other things, so a little bit like here in our picture. So let's run this program. So, and you see the true value of the Bermudan option would be 9.2, but if you exercise this perfect foresight, you would have 11.9. So you have super optimal exercise. So your option has a much higher value because you can base your exercise decision on the future. And this is now visible here in these plots. Okay, so first let's have a look at these plots that I generated. I told you I will plot, so upper left, the value of the stock where I have arrived and the value that I will get if I continue. So this here. So you see, sometimes if I continue, I have here a zero. So actually this zero happens very often. So in this picture, this is like that. You arrive, for example, here. Yeah. So this is now your S of T1, okay? But then the stochastic process continues and it moves maybe here and you receive a zero. Uh, anyway, at that point here, yeah, you would maybe exercise immediately because you see what you get if you exercise is larger than what you expect to get via the Black-Schultz formula. But it may also happen that you arrive here at a low value, and when the stochastic process continues, the S of T2 arrives here, and you get a positive payoff. So these are the red dots. The red dots is what you get if you continue. Yeah? Often you fall to the zero, but sometimes you get a higher value because the stochastic process has moved up yeah, and you get a higher payoff. So the blue line is actually my Black-Scholes formula. Yeah? So this is my expected continuation value, which I'm also plotting. Yeah? The expected continuation value is the value of the second option observed in T1. So this is my Black-Scholes formula. So this is the second thing I plot. This is the Black-Scholes formula. So when should you exercise? So you compare the value of the underlying, which is the green curve here, to the Black-Scholes formula. And at the crossing point, you change your decision. So here at the crossing point, this means if your stock is below, you continue because your Black-Scholes formula is above. And if the green line is above, yeah, you would exercise. Yeah? So you see that your decision is here a vertical split. A vertical split means that I'm FT1 measurable. Actually, I'm even measurable with respect to the sigma field generated by the value of the stock in time T1. So it's not important what has happened before time T1. It's just important what has happened in time T1. Uh, why is that? So actually, the sigma field that defines the decision is much smaller. Uh, it's just generated by what you observed in time T1. And it's not important if you have moved up and then down and arrived here, or if you have moved down and then up and arrived here. Uh, 
Yeah, you see this immediately because your conditional expectation is a Black Scholes formula, and the Black Scholes formula only depends on the initial value of the stock. This is an important insight for later, yeah, because I would like to make the sigma field with respect to which I condition, I would like to make it small. So this is a vertical split here. And next plot is what we have if I use perfect foresight. If I use perfect foresight, actually, I'm not creating a vertical line here yeah, that splits between left side and right side. I have the split between am I above the green line or am I below the green line? So actually, I use the information, where do I end in time T2? If I end up higher, yeah, I will continue, so I will not exercise. So if I end up lower, yeah, I will take the green line yeah, and I will exercise. So you have these figures for our numerical experiment also here in the script. Yeah? So this is the value where we arrive, yeah? for example, S of T1 yeah? and several omegas. And then we have, say, dots here. And these dots is, okay, the X component is the value where we have arrived with the stock. So it is now here an omega K. And then what we get if we continue. So this is the value of the second option observed in T2 on that sample path omega K. So this would be, for example, su such a dot. And what I actually like is to have the conditional expectation. So I would like to have the conditional expectation of all these values that would lie on the line. Unfortunately, in my Monte Carlo simulation, I can expect that there's only one sample pass that lies exactly on the line. Yeah, only one sample pass will have here this value of the stock as t1 omega k yeah this x this omega k okay only one sample pass is starting there but the true analytic conditional expectation is this value here so this vertical value is now my conditional expectation v2 t2 actually divide by the numeraire, multiplied with the numeraire. Yeah? So divide by numeraire at payment time, multiplied with the numeraire at the evaluation time. So this object observed on sample pass omega k. Yeah, so note important, this here is the conditional expectation, right? So maybe let's fix this. For admissible optimal exercise, you now find there is a value of the stock that gives you the information, should you exercise or not, because the value of the stock in time T1 has all the information that you need. It is the quantity that determines the conditional expectation, because in your Black Schultz formula, you start at this point. And here you continue and here you exercise. But for perfect foresight, you just compare is the dot that you observe, so these dots here, is it above the green line or is it below the green line? Yeah, and you see, yeah, now your decision is on a vertical range, yeah, so it uses information here from uh, from the future. And uh, this example yeah, gives us a bit intuition because there's an important thing here. You see that 
our conditional expectation is just a function of the stock. So the sigma field could be generated by a random variable. And in an Euler scheme, actually, this FT1 is generated by all Brownian increments that you have used up to time T1. Okay, these could be already 10 time steps or 100 time steps. So many different Brownian increments, a high dimensional random variable. But in this example, the only thing that determines the exercise criteria or determines the conditional expectation is here the value of the stock that I observe at time T1. So instead of having conditional to a sigma field, I can also write it conditional to a random variable. And this is the next important step. I can describe now the conditional expectation as a function of a random variable. Because you see, this blue line here is a function of the stock value at time T1. This function is the Plexschutz formula. So my conditional expectation is a function of a random variable. So if the random variable Z generates the sigma field FT1, then I can just rewrite the conditional expectation of a random variable conditional to FT1 as being conditional to that random variable, conditional to the values that have been attained by this random variable. But sometimes, and this depends now on what is the quantity for which you calculate the conditional expectation? You can use a random variable Z that has far less information. Yeah? Because to calculate the conditional expectation of our European option payoff, the Black Scholz formula is enough. And the Black Scholz formula does not require all the information up to time T1. It just requires the information where it has the stock ended at time T1. So to some extent, yeah, it is Markovian. Yeah? It just requires the starting value where I'm in time, time T1. So we may be in situations where the sigma field generated by Z is smaller than FT1, depending on the guy that is inside this conditional expectation. So let's consider now where I write the conditional expectation always in terms of such a random variable. Assume I can find it, yeah? the stock or in the general case, all my Brown increments. Then I can describe the conditional expectation instead of being a random variable, which is a function of omega. Yeah? I can describe it now as a function of a value, little z. Yeah? So now I have a function that maps little z to the condition expectation of the guy that I would like to condition, for which I would like to have the conditional expectation, conditional that my random variable z is equal to little z. So this is the same as saying the conditional expectation evaluated on omega, which means conditional that z is equal to z of that omega. So my little z is the value that I observe on the sample path. Okay, I can interpret now my conditional expectation as a function of some random value. So we had this little plot yeah, on my horizontal axis is, for example, a random variable, the stock value, and the conditional expectation is a, uh, is a function of this guy. This also holds in the very general case. Yeah? So in the very general case, you can always find a random variable z yeah, such that the inverse yeah, of the random variable z applied to 
all possible values, yeah, all possible outcomes, the Borel, Borel sigma field, this will be exactly your sigma field FT1. So this holds always. For example, in our time discrete Eto stochastic process, this Z is just the vector of all the Brownian increments. So if you know the vector of all the Brownian increments, you know the whole sample path that you have simulated, and you know the condition value. So I can always replace the conditional expectation with respect to FT1 with a conditional expectation with respect to a random variable Z, yeah, where the random variable Z is now described by certain values. But of course, this case here would be very impractical. Yeah? Um, actually, the delta W can take a continuum of values. Yeah? And if I have many time steps, yeah, this is practically what the re-simulation does. Yeah? Uh, I have to record all possible combinations of these values. Okay, but now we made an improvement. So it's only relevant what is the value of some random variable at a certain time. And now if you go back to this little picture, you suddenly maybe immediately guess what is a nice numerical method to calculate the conditional expectation. So if you would like to calculate the conditional expectation, conditional to the random variable z having arrived at that point, it means that you need to average all values where you have arrived at that point. Since there are only very few values, you could create some kind of bin. Let's take all the values yeah, that have arrived at this interval around S of T1. So now take all the vertical values, so all these dots here, and calculate the average of all these. So if I take all these dots, that lie in this bin. Okay, the analytic conditional expectation is this function, but if I just take all the dots that lie in this interval, yeah, I get one value, I get a constant, maybe I get that value. Okay, but maybe now I have a method to create a piecewise constant approximation of my conditional expectation. By the way, here in the picture, you wouldn't believe that the conditional expectation is so low, but you have to recall there are a lot of values around uh, zero here. So this is now the first technique that really works. Yeah? It's binning. So in binning, we actually replace the condition with respect to Z on a specific sample path, which means to condition on a single value of the Z, so Z of omega, we replace this by Z being in some epsilon neighborhood around that value. So I have a kind of bin here, a neighborhood around that value. So, and now the perfect foresight is a little bit reduced because there's not only a single sample path lying in this bin, there are many. Yeah? So this here can be now a Monte Carlo approximation that uses many sample paths. So here you find the idea. Huh? I create different bins here. And now I, by conditioning on this bin, I take all the sample paths that pass through this bin and I take the future values from these guys to calculate the conditional expectation as a piecewise constant function. It's now a functional of my yeah, condition variable Z. There's a small modification. Instead of using an epsilon neighborhood here for every omega, a new one, I can also use a partitioning of my set of possible values. So I use a partitioning of set of omega, a given partitioning, say, ui, 
And then I create my piecewise constant approximations of the conditional expectations by averaging over all the sample paths where Z is in the bin UI. Yeah? So this will be now my approximation for the conditional expectation. So the this guy here is the HI if Z of omega lies in my bin UI. Yeah? So this is approximated with HI, yeah, I have a piecewise constant approximation. Okay, so let's study this again for our simple Bermudan option on a stock, but let's do that uh, in the next session. Yeah. This will then be the figure. You see that now instead of my black scholes formula, yeah, I have a piecewise constant approximation yeah, so I have these guys here that approximate the conditional expectation, but note that we need the conditional expectation only in the decision, and a small error in the decision is not so not, not such a big problem. That was it for today.